time has a way of healing wounds and softening the wounded. Like other veterans who fought in Vietnam, Ed Eaton came home somewhat bewildered and betrayed. He had volunteered and gone off to fight for his country. He had followed orders and did his tour with honor and distinction. Yet when he returned home, he was forced into silence by a nation that wanted to move on, to forget about his service and the things that he and others had encountered there. My father was a disciplinarian, being an ex-Marine. Uh, I couldn't go to school without my giggling being in order. Uh, bed always had to be in order. Uh, my word was was everything to him. Ed Eaton was a country boy from Milton Freewater, a sleepy little town not far from the bend in the Columbia River, on the Oregon side of the Washington-Oregon border. Fishing, hunting, mountains were a major part of my life, and uh, uh, my dad got me off on the right foot there. I joined the National Guard when I was a senior in high school, and it was pretty much nothing more than a lunchtime dare. At 17, Eaton would have to get his parents' signature, which his mother gave in to, reluctantly. Vietnam, of course, was uh, coming upon us. It was almost like looking at old newsreels of Korea and the Pacific War. The same young old faces, the same shattered landscape, the same agony. You have friends that are being drafted, friends that are joining. Uh, I really didn't feel like I needed to be part of the civilian conjecture as to what was going on over there until I'd actually walked in their shoes and, and had a feeling as to what I was talking about. He volunteered to go active duty, in which I thought that's a weird thing to do in the late 60s. And most people were trying to avoid military service. And Born in a small Mormon town in Utah, Mike Perkins followed his father around the country and the world as the military brat of an Army Air Corps pilot. Joining the Army, Perkins had aspirations of becoming a paratrooper. In February 1964, he applied for Officer Candidate School, OCS. He went on to Fort Benning and received his commission as an infantry officer. There was a lot of us reported in for Special Forces School, but there was a lot fewer that finished it, I can tell you that. Mike Perkins eventually got his orders to Vietnam in the Special Forces School he'd been hoping for. I reported to Vietnam almost a month early because I just didn't want to wait any longer. Well, being the uh, son of a former Marine, my father was rather dismayed that I would go into the Army. I tried to explain to him that I wanted to be a medic. The Marine Corps had no medics, and I really had this empathy about me when it came to the wounded. But uh, the Army had different plans for me and decided I should go uh, take some infantry training. I remember telling that Simon officer, I said, he said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I want to go where there's, uh, I can get some, get some action. He said, uh, that's everywhere. It wasn't until the door opened up uh, in Benoit that I really realized I was someplace different. The stench was almost overwhelming. The country reeked of death. Assigned to a riverine unit in the Mekong Delta, Eaton and others in his company lived aboard the USS Westchester, moored out in the middle of a river where they used landing craft and helicopters to make ventures off into bad guy country to fight. It wasn't the nicest place in the world. The mosquito infestation was incredible. Bug juice did you no good because you sweated off right off the bat. So you had to learn how to deal with mosquitoes. Your first three or four days in the Mekong Delta, you lose the feeling of your trigger finger. Your eyes can are barely open. Your lips can't feel your canteen. Your water dribbles down your chin. And you finally just get to the point where, you know, mosquitoes on your nose or your lips or whatever, you just let him do what he does. We were so thirsty that we would come up to these rain barrels and they would have maybe an inch of mosquitoes on top of them. And you just split the mosquitoes apart, stick your face down there and start sucking at them. You know, you're, thirst is a, an amazing thing. So, you know, he had 110 degree uh, weather and... Uh, it's a miserable place. Six eight zero one zero zero. Six eight zero one zero zero. Six eight zero zero zero. Ed Eden's first assignment for a squad in country was that of a radio operator. I hated the job, but looking back on it, it was really one of the best things that ever happened to me because I understood a little bit better how an infantry unit functioned. I had a little better feeling as to what was going on than your average infantryman. On my third tour, I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Division, which I was down in the Delta. I remember sitting down with uh, 
the former company commander, and uh, he mentioned a couple of platoon sergeants. He mentioned that uh, we have a sniper, he's very good, and a few other things, and uh, he was gone. And so uh, he mentioned the sniper. I did, well, that's nice, I've got a good sniper with me. And it turned out that was Ed Eaton. I was the first sniper to flunk sniper school. When the opportunity presented itself for him to attend sniper school, he jumped at the chance. When they melted everybody down to 10 people, that was the best shot of the bunch. I missed my 900 meter targets and I flunked the course. He was sent back to his unit without a certificate of completion or a diploma. So I went back to my unit and I uh, took what I learned, put a starlight scope on my M16 and I started using it. When I needed to use that starlight scope or when I needed him to do something <clears throat> difficult, I had no hesitation about saying, Ed, come over, I need some help, and he'd, he'd respond. Well, my company never knew that I wasn't a sniper. I remember uh, pointing out a target to him one time, and uh, I could see a guy way out there, seven, 800 meters, and I said, look at him, Ed, has he got a rifle? And he said, he does, and I said, shoot him, and he did, just like that. And I knew that this kid was good with that, with that rifle that he had. They started calling in some of my kills as my, our sniper. Well, those kills went to the sniper school. They called me in, gave me a sniper rifle, and said, "Hey, you're, if you're going to be doing this, we want you. You know, we got an extra rifle. You might as well be using the right equipment." Eventually, he was allowed to retake the sniper shooting test he had failed, and was officially awarded his certificate and badge as a full-fledged scout sniper. So, and when we did these raids, he went on about half of them, at least half of them, or more, with me, because I needed his expertise, and he never turned me down. And that's how I get, got to know him real well. On April 3rd, 1969, Captain Mike Perkins was looking for a few volunteers to conduct a recon or search and destroy mission of a hamlet near Cantu, along a river fork of the Mekong Delta. It was an all-volunteer mission, and uh, it was called rather late. Uh, we probably only had an hour or two to get our act in order. I was worried, am I going to get enough volunteers to go? Well, when I had Ed going that night, so all of a sudden we had all the volunteers we needed. Eaton, along with eight others, volunteered. And that night, the 10-man team was airlifted and dropped off into a rice paddy near the target. Evidently, there had been an, a heavy amount of radio communications coming out of this specific area. They figured they had a radio transmitter. If you've got a radio transmitter, that's got to be battalion or regimental headquarters. We went in with two teams. Uh, Captain Perkins had a team on his Huey, and I had a team on my Huey. It was uh, two lift ships, a command and control helicopter, and uh, two Cobra gunships. We were told to get in and get out because the helicopters couldn't stay, couldn't loiter as long as we anticipated. We landed, and that we had as kind of an L-shaped series of hooches, if you will, in the wood line. His team went in on one end, and my team went in on the other. We had uh, one of the ugliest rice patties I had ever dealt with. Full of uh, cow manure and whatever, but it was deep. We were losing time right off the bat. They began to search the grass and palm thatch hooches for any evidence of enemy presence or support. We found old women and young kids and young mothers and a couple of old men. No military age males. We'd been on the ground about 15 or 20 minutes. And I wanted to get out earlier, but we had so many hooches to clear and hadn't found a thing. That is, until one of his men found the entrance of a bunker and a tunnel structure on one of the dike chutes for a walking path. When I shined my light down in the tunnel, it was made out of concrete and had rebar staircase climbing down. And I thought, well, this is weird because you don't find very many tunnels in the Delta. And this may have been the very thing we were supposed to have found, but now we've been on the ground too long. Mike Perkins knew that this tunnel's sophistication meant that he and his men had stumbled onto a fighting force much larger than the small handful of men he had brought with him. We were, I think we had over our heads with 10 men on the ground and we needed to get out of there now. While he radioed the helicopter to return for their extraction, he quickly contacted his men and got them moving as far away from the hamlet and the tunnel as possible. In the meantime, the enemy, the VC, they are moving on the paddy dikes parallel to us. I could hear them talking. I could hear them talking about the helicopters. I could talk, hear them talking about automatic weapons. So we did the best we could, got out into the middle of the rice paddy. The Hueys came down and, uh, and they opened up on us. The whole world just turned green. You could have read a newspaper. Thankfully, two Cobra gunships came in hot and laid down some significant cover fire as the two extraction birds touched down right behind them for his men. We were gone in a matter of seconds. We were just on and gone. The mission's over with, though, as far as everybody's concerned, and we're taking off to where we have to go, and 
Everybody's changing frequencies, and then we realize we have a guy on the ground. You could see him laying down. I didn't know he was alive or dead. But I told the other helicopter that they had to go ahead and get him, and we'd follow behind. The first helo sat down, and the man in the mud popped up and bolted for the helicopter. He jumped up, jumped in one door, and somebody jumped out the other door, and the helicopter took off, and now we're still left with the guy. Perkins told his helo pilot to drop down and get him and then went in after him with intense weapons fire. We received fire from our left flank, and so I was in the process of firing back myself. But we didn't make it. We took rounds, shattered the cockpit, and we pitched in the air and then turned to the right. Just before we crashed, I jumped. It was a violent crash. Just beat the hell out of everybody. Captain Perkins was, was stuck underneath it, and my head was stuck under the water. But I was able to wiggle out from underneath it, but there was still a round spursing the helicopter. Tracers. Uh, you, you, you think of fire. So my main purpose in life immediately was just to get everybody out of the helicopter. I remember thinking, this is a heck of a way to die. This is a heck of a way to go. Captain Perkins actually got to the point where he had taken out a knife and was cutting off his arm. A bunch of people got together and rocked the helicopter the best they could and got him out. And the guy who was in charge of all that and making it happen was Ed. And from then on, it was just defending the position. Eventually, the gunships returned, made gun runs, but they ran out of ammunition. And that's when I crawled on top of the helicopter to try to man the M60. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't working. And I just started screaming for guys to throw me weapons. These guys are closing on us and closing fast. The door gunner was uh, putting new magazines in the rifles and throwing them back up to me. Eaton began returning fire on the advancing enemy soldiers, who outnumbered them 30 to 1. Every time you throw an M16 up, I just unload it positions they were firing from. He could see the muzzle blast. There's at least 20 or 30 AKs firing at us. We were all hunkering down behind that paddy dike. And I never knew it was going to come out of those M16s. Some of the magazines were loaded with tracers, some weren't. In hindsight, he believes that this variation of gunfire convinced the enemy that there was a number of people fighting back. He's exposed to all that fire, and he's the only one returning fire. The fact that others were not returning fire frightened him. He knew that everyone had been beaten up really badly, and that there were very few weapons that had survived the crash. So I, I was very afraid of my life, and I, I knew that uh, um, something had to be done. I could see all the bullets impacting on right, right below him. This is leaking fuel all over the place. I'm covered in it. He's up there, he's got it all over him too. And I, I thought, any minute now, he and I are gonna become human torches. Fortunately, he found my sniper rifle and got my starlight scope. I could see what was going on, fired off a few rounds with it. Didn't seem to do anything to him. You could see the stock was broken off and he was holding it out there like this because he couldn't put it against his shoulder. Evidently my uh, scope was askew. Ed could now see in the darkness, but his shots were nowhere near their mark. But nevertheless, it gave me an idea of where they're at. So I would use the M14, I'd fire a round off or two in the direction each time and then I'd pick up an M16 and dump a magazine off at him. Somewhere along in there, I actually uh, I fired around and I saw my round hit down below and in the water and the reflection uh, off the water uh, bounced back and so I had a pretty good idea where my round was landing so through your basic Kentucky windage I was able to hold up and to the left and uh, and uh, finally started getting some deadly fire in, uh, on them. But that was really I think what turned the tide at that point. A guy would put a magazine in and hand it up to him and He'd uh, pick it up and he'd put out a burst of automatic fire, hand it back down. I was getting rid of him faster than he could reload him. And he'd calmly get that M14 going where he could knock people down. He was keeping them off our backs. Eden is not sure how long this engagement lasted, but there was little doubt that they were in serious trouble. When the first helicopter came in to pick up people, Eden and Captain Perkins watched as a number of people piled on. The three or four guys ran and got on the first helicopter. It turned and flew away with arms and legs, people hanging on to the ammunition doors, and, and uh, one guy draped across the gunner's position. Second helicopter, they tried to get me on it, I think, but it loaded on, and Ed apparently finally jumped down and got on that helicopter, and I, I just gave up. I couldn't move. Weak from the loss of blood and injury sustained during the crash, he feared he wouldn't have enough strength to hang on during flight. As they left him, someone placed a grenade into his hand. As I lay on that paddy dike, I watched that helicopter leave, and I realized I'm all by myself here. I'm the last guy left. When it turned, I saw a guy jump off. But I heard uh, Ed, I was Ed's voice, very clear. He says, I won't leave the old man to die alone. 
It just wasn't something I was going to do. I just, it just wasn't in me at that point. That helicopter took off. Mike and I thought we were by ourselves. I know the bad guys are going to be there very, very soon. Then he fired around, and I kind of saw the corner of my eye over there that somebody stepped around the nose of that airplane, which is 10 feet away, maybe at max. I don't know. And down he went, and, and then shortly afterwards, I don't know how long it was, another guy stepped around, around the edge of that nose, and he fired and killed him too. These guys are they're serious about this. They're coming for us. Thankfully, with time running out, the pilot and commander in charge of the insertion force, Colonel Peterson, realized that they still had men on the ground and brought his bird back in to rescue them. Lo and behold, here's a couple other guys uh, buying the down Huey that we didn't know about. Six or seven guys still huddled but underneath the tail of the airplane. Now, Ed, who saved my life, the helicopter doesn't have room for Ed. In fact, there's not enough room to the point that the colonel asked his Tiger Scout interpreter to get off. So, so he takes off, and uh, we're left behind. Uh, you're getting ready for the worst of it, but uh, uh, somebody knew that we were down there, and uh, so here comes the uh, here comes the Cobras back, and uh, they took us on about a 15, 20 minute ride to uh, a rice paddy in the middle of I have no idea where where the pilot signaled for him and the Tiger Scout to get off the helicopter. He didn't want to turn any lights on because he didn't land. He's hovering. The guy's talking on the canopy to tell me to get off his helicopter, and I'm going, you're, you're crazy, SOB. I'm not getting off this thing, but I didn't have far to land. It was four or five feet is all. That was when I first realized that I couldn't walk, that uh, I was only capable of crawling at that point in time. In the middle of nowhere, and then in the dark, he has no idea where he is and what's going on and leaves him the third time. I'm going, you know, what the hell's going on here? I mean, how many times do I have to be rescued? But... So we waited there, and uh, in time, a uh, uh, Huey Dustoff came in and picked me up. And brought back to Dongtan, where they come to find out he's also got a broken back, and he's got a bullet that ricocheted and taken his, his chin skin was hanging down here. I didn't really realize that I had any shrapnel to my face to be honest with you. Until I got on that helicopter on the Cobra and I'm sitting outside and we're flying along about 80 miles an hour and my chin started flapping around. I had no idea that I'd even been shot in the finger. Um, didn't even realize, I don't suppose that my back was broke until I had to try to get off that Cobra. I didn't realize that I couldn't walk until I couldn't walk. So, you know, I probably had as much adrenaline in me as a man could have, so. Had he not rose up that night and defended us, none of us would have, none of us would have survived that. And had he not come back to get me, or come back to be with me, I, w I wouldn't have survived another 10 minutes and neither would have those, those guys because they were on us. Uh, he survived it all and, and uh, with not much comment or complaint. It's a great feeling to be the hell out of there and uh, it's a great feeling to see Mike uh, being taken care of. I got talking to him and I said, how many rounds are you, something like that, you got left? And he said, I have five rounds left. And I thought, you know, here's a guy who came back, he had five rounds, after he killed those two guys, he had five rounds left. Years later, I talked to him and he said, well, he's gonna do the best I could with those five rounds and then I, he was gonna shoot me and then shoot himself before he was gonna be taken. He'd made that decision to come and defend me to, to the last round. I don't know what else to say. I, 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 can you say something about a man who would do that? How would anybody come back to die with you? I, I don't know how you can do that, but he did. What defines valor for some may not for others. Those who have served in the proximity of war know that acts of valor often go undocumented, get lost in the shuffle, and sometimes completely forgotten altogether. Some of the most deserving demonstrations of courage the most heroic acts imaginable, never get noticed. Mike Perkins knows the danger of squandering just recognition and the importance of never delivering unmerited praise. In the past few years, he's been on a mission to make sure that one man's just due is given. One man's life-saving heroics are honored and recognized. To offer his life up and if the life of another, uh, certainly I think merits the Medal of Honor. I was in a hospital in Japan and I couldn't use my limbs very well, so I had a nurse. She sat down, wrote it out, and I signed it. We put it in the mail and sent it. I thought it would be taken care of. Well, <clears throat> I didn't pay much attention to it, and years went by, and 
he'd got nothing from that night. And uh, nothing. Losing all those years, a little bit of a disappointment that it didn't get recognized. Now to find out that I'm being put in for the Medal of Honor is, I was blown away. This man deserves everything that we can give him. And in my opinion, if they downgraded or refused to hear this, they've done a great disservice to a, to a true American and to a guy who really uh, merits, uh, merits recognition, uh, such as the Medal of Honor. According to military regulation, the Medal of Honor is awarded to a soldier who performs a deed of personal bravery that goes well beyond the call of duty and involves the risk of life. Nobody can ever doubt what he did that night. At least those who were there cannot doubt what he did for us. And so I owe, I owe him my life. I just did what I had to do that night. You know, that's, uh, in their eyes, uh, I went beyond uh, call of duty and, uh, you know, fine. Uh, I feel honored that they uh, look at me that way. And uh, I feel really honored that 40 some years later that David, uh, can, you know, decided that, hey, this, this battle needs to, you know, be brought forth. Today, Ed Eaton lives a simple life with little regret, hard feelings, or ill will. He remembers his time in Vietnam with fond appreciation of the experience and says that if called upon, he would do it all over again. Yet he also reflects upon the fear, the cost, and the brothers who did not come home. He has visited the wall in Washington and rubbed the names of those maybe forgotten by a country that he will never forget. There are more than names on a panel for a year in which they gave America so much. They are friends and blood brothers who shared experiences and war that should never be taken for granted. He is no longer tormented by the images of death or the memories of his days in Vietnam. While they are not hidden, and while he may never be able to reconcile the pain he feels for his brothers tragically lost, he accepts that an honorable cause, in spite of its outcome, was no less served by the blood of honorable men.